In this movie, I'm going to show you how we go through and use the values that are associated with different decisions to draw conclusions about which of two policies might be more preferred. So I've set up a spreadsheet, and it looks kind of complicated here, but I'm going to talk you through it. We're going to start out with just the raw data here. So this was done in an experiment where we have two groups of subjects. So here's the first group of subjects here. And notice that they were not allowed to use an inconclusive rating. So in this particular experiment, subjects saw patches of images on the screen, uh, patches of features, and they had to decide based on those features whether two impressions came from the same source. Now, subjects in this experiment uh, could not say inconclusive. Other subjects, however, in the same experiment, were allowed to say inconclusive. So here you have the three types of decisions that were available to the subjects, although in subjects in condition one here, could not make the inclusive uh, response. So in each trial, they had to say either identification, meaning that two impressions came from the same source, or exclusion, which meant that the two impressions did not come from the same source. So in the, on each trial, they saw four features. So that's set size four here, and they made these responses. Um, after that, they saw an additional four features for a total of eight features. and that then they made a second decision based on those features and that allows them to um, improve their response potentially. Okay, so in this particular experiment we have um, actually more subjects in condition one than in condition two. That just happens to be the way the experiment came out. You can see that there were 468 trials uh, where the um, images were mated, meaning they came from the same source and 468 where they were non-mated because there were an equal number of mated and non-mated trials in this particular experiment. Now, in this particular experiment in condition one, we had mated trials and on 242 out of the 468, the subjects made a correct identification. Um, however, they made 165 um, erroneous identifications. Now, these are novice subjects, so it's not a shock that they uh, came to this conclusion, but there are a fair number of errors here. Now let's see what happens when we go to the situation where subjects are allowed to say inconclusive. Now you can see that was a very popular choice, especially for set size four. Um, the number of errors drops from 165 down to 49. That seems good. We've reduced the number of errors. However, the number of correct responses jumps from 242 down to 91. And that seems bad because we've lost all of these correct responses here. Likewise, we can see down here these are trials in which the stimuli were actually mated, but in fact the subjects chose to exclude those, and that's also an error. Um, that's an erroneous exclusion, or a miss in the parlance of signal detection theory. And you can see if we give people the option to make an inconclusive response, the number of errors drops from 260, 226 down to 35, so that seems good. However, the number of correct answers, where they correctly concluded that it's an exclusion, on non-mated trials. That drops from 303 down to 60. So the good things are dropping as well as the bad things are dropping as we allow for inconclusive responses. So we need to think about how to value these different responses to know whether to prefer the policy that allows you to have inconclusive responses versus the policy that doesn't allow you to have an inconclusive responses. It's possible that allowing people to make in, um, inconclusive responses allows them to make decisions on only the highly accurate of the easy trials, relatively speaking, um, essentially choosing not to respond on the hard trials, and that may improve their performance. However, you might also argue that if you force people to make a decision, you might allow them to use partial information or make an, an intuitive guess that would improve their overall performance um, beyond people who might be sort of kicking back and, and only making an, a response when they really feel confident or really feel like there's a lot of information. So we can ask which of these two policies one might prefer and which overall is better for the judicial system and the uh, forensic community. So here's where, how we're going to do that to decide which of these two policies we prefer, the one that doesn't allow inconclusive responses or the one that does allow inconclusive responses. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to convert our um, responses to proportions. It doesn't actually really matter uh, that we do this, but 
it does allow us to deal with the fact that there were many more trials in the condition one than in condition two in this particular experiment. So we simply take the overall responses for the each um, the number of responses in each category and divide it by the number of trials here. So that's what, what this is doing right here. And we use that same formula all the way across here. All right. And we can do this for set size 8 as well, but we'll just consider set size 4 for now. Okay. Now, the next step in this policy analysis is to think about the values that are associated with different outcomes. And it turns out that these are pivotal in which policy we'll end up preferring, and it's frustrating that there is no right answer here. There's no answer that's delivered to us from science. There's no quantitative way to determine what these values are. Instead, these values are determined by us as a society in, in terms of us believing the values, judging the, the merits of different outcomes here. So let me talk you through how we're going to um, choose some values. And then ultimately, we'll, we'll choose different values to, to decide kind of where we feel as a community uh, these different values should be given. So here's the way, the way we start. The first thing we'll do is we have to set the scale. So we're arbitrarily going to say that making a correct identification here gets the value of 1. It's just a starting point. We could have put 100, we could have put 10, but it's just something to get us started. Everything else is going to be relative to this. All right. The next thing we should do is we should give a value of an erroneous identification. Now, erroneous identification, it seems, should be bad, that everyone can agree on that, and so it's likely to be negative. Um, and it's probably, you could argue, that it's 10 times worse than making a correct identification. So we're going to put a minus 10 here. And then we can put a value for the exclusion down here. I'm going to take these other uh, values away here temporarily. So we can imagine that exclusions here um, this erroneous exclusion isn't as bad somehow. That failing to put someone in jail is not quite as bad as putting someone who's innocent in jail. And so, and you know, you could argue that maybe there's some other evidence that will uh, convict this guy. Maybe they'll, you know, cr criminals tend to convict, commit more crimes. Maybe the next latent print will get him. So you could argue that. Uh, having this 10 to 1 ratio is appropriate in this particular context. Benjamin Franklin argued for a 100 to 1 uh, ratio. Blackwell has argued for a 10 to 1 ratio. So let, let's just try that. Um, and then if you have a non-mated trial and you correctly exclude, then that seems to be positive. And it, we could say that's get, that gets a plus 1 here in terms of our um, a value. The, the same as giving a correct identification here. A correct exclusion, that seems to be also meaningful. Although, again, you could argue a couple of other things. You could say that, well, first of all, exclusions are really the only scientifically valid conclusion one could derive from uh, latent print examinations because it's clear when things are different, but it's hard to judge when things are really, really similar. I don't actually particularly subscribe to that logic, but uh, that, that, has, that argument has been advanced. Um, you could also argue that correct, that, that correct exclusions don't actually solve crimes. They might help you eliminate a victim, or they might help you uh, eliminate other suspects, but they don't tell you which guy did it. And so you might argue that this should be something less than one. Maybe it should be 0.5 or something like that. Um, but you can kind of get a feel for the logic that we're going to use here in trying to identify what these values should be. Uh, when we're tr trying to decide these different values. So let's just use these values as a starting point here. Uh, and we can go back and forth about what these are. And, and I, I hope actually that this discussion spurs a discussion among the community of forensic scientists about where these, what these values should be. Because they really do affect how we set up uh, standard operating procedures and how we think about where to set decision criteria for how much evidence we require in order to uh, come to a conclusion. The final thing that we need to do here is come up with a value for inconclusive. And this is probably the most difficult thing that I've struggled with as I've thought about these issues. I really don't know what values to put here. 
Uh, and it, this is why I'm looking forward to talking to members of the forensic science community as we think about the um, how we might judge these different SOPs. You could make the argument here that inconclusives should be uh, negative because they take away the opportunity to make a correct decision. Um, however, you could also argue that they should be positive because they um, prevent you from making an error. And I think the way to think about this is that the rest of the math that I'll talk you through here actually takes those takes care of that kind of logic. So don't think of inconclusive as what it can do for you or what it can't do for you. Think about just in general what is the value of an inconclusive decision. So if you are a prosecutor or defense attorney and you send some prints off for analysis and the um, the, the results come back as inconclusive and not even giving it a claim of like I think it's, it might be an, an exclusion but I'm not sure I'm gonna say inconclusive it's just inconclusive is that helpful for you um, well maybe if you're the defense attorney uh, any evidence that doesn't implicate your client is a net positive for you maybe if you're the um, the detective that has developed a lead and it comes back inconclusive maybe that's a setback for you um, I don't, it seems to me personally, and we can try out different values here, it seems to me personally that the inconclusive value is something that is maybe slightly positive. It, it does, it, a conclusion was reached, some evidence was processed, and that by itself should give some value. Um, so for me, I'm going to give it a slight positive value, maybe 0.3 or something like that. Um, we could talk about different sets of values for different types of crimes. Uh, you could actually make the the inconclusive positive for mates and, and negative for non-mates if you want. Uh, you could advance that argument. And my point here is that we can try out different values here based on discussions, philosophical discussions like this. And those are important discussions to have because they, they fundamentally affect the conclusions that we draw, but they don't necessarily, they aren't something that we regularly discuss as a community. And I think that's a mistake because I think it implicitly it's been going on and people have intuitively come up with their own values here. Um, I think gen in general people have, latent print examiners have been told not to make errors. Um, and so as a, as a result, they've really not made these kinds of errors. They've not made erroneous identifications. But they probably make a lot of erroneous exclusions as a result because they're very conservative in terms of how much evidence they require before making a conclusion. So the, intuitively or, or implicitly within the community, this discussion has been, been going on. And I think it's important for us to actually push it to the fore to really talk about what values we want for these different uh, types of outcomes, and that will really affect where we place our decision criteria um, to sort of match these, as well as to adjust our different uh, SOPs so that they correspond with how we feel the values from society are, are dictating the, the, the outcomes that we uh, would like to see. So that was a very long-winded discussion about these values, and we'll come back to, the, to how we're going to go through and, and choose different values, but this is a starting starting point right here. Okay, so I'm going to stop the movie right here um, to give you a chance to think about these things and then in the next movie I'll talk you through the next step of converting these values to a, a discussion of which overall policy allowing inconclusives or not allowing inconclusives produces the most utility maximizing result.